this is the indications for nerve transfer is another way of saying what are the advantages of nerve transfer? Well, the advantages are that for a preganglionic or proximal lesion of the nerve roots of the brachial plexus, as I just said, you don't have a lot of options for graft repair. Certainly, if you have a nerve injury with a long distance to the target muscle, so something like a proximal ulnar nerve lesion, that's very difficult for a repair to work, but a distal nerve transfer may do you better. And then, of course, if you run into significant other injuries, that precludes nerve repair, or if it's a failed brachial plexus, grafting, or proximal nerve repair, and of course, delayed uh, presentation of uh, nerve injury. All right, so how do you practically then choose your donor and recipient? So these are generally the rules you stick with. Donors should be expendable nerves with reasonable amount of motor fibers. You wanna make sure you're delivering enough motor fibers to make this uh, recipient muscle work. The recipient should be an undamaged distal portion of the nerve, because if you have a scarred up distal portion, that's probably not gonna accept the nerve transfer very well at all, in which case you've now just uh, sacrificed a donor nerve for no purpose. The donor and recipient should be in anatomical proximity to the end organ muscle, because the closer you get it to the muscle, of course, the better often quicker you'll get results. And donor and recipient should ideally provide synergistic effects, but what I'll show you is one of the nerve transfers coming up, but there doesn't seem to be any difference uh, with which fascicle to own the nerve you take to re the bicep. It just seems like uh, any of them will work as long as they're motor. So let's get back to brachial plexus. So what are the priorities for functional restoration? Well, I list them here as shoulder function and stability, elbow flexion, hand prehension, and sensibility. And the only evidence that we have for this is that we did some functional studies on some nerve transfer patients. And it just turns out that the more shoulder function they had, the more they used their arm overall in their activity of daily living. So it's not saying that elbow flexion is not important. In fact, to the surgeons, the elbow flexion is much easier to reconstruct with nerve grafting and nerve transfer. So for the longest time, we just assumed that the patient also wanted elbow flexion. But it just turns out that if you can, if you have a good shoulder, you actually do better. And I think that a lot of the orthopedic surgeons probably understand that inherently. Of course, hand prehension and sensibility is very important. Um, if you don't have sensation in your hand, oftentimes people will just drop it down on something hot, burn themselves, it gets infected, and then you have a problem. Certainly, if you're dealing about with dealing with babies and brachial plexus injury the only shot you have is really to go ahead and try to get them hand prehension at the time of the initial exam. So let's talk about these priorities then. For brachial plexus injury, of course, that it affects all the arm. So we just talked about how important shoulder function is. So how do we use nerve transfers to get that back? So again, given that this webinar is time limited and we wanted to give you an overall overview of this, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what it is we do on a standard basis. Many of us use a spinal accessory branch and transfer it to the suprascapular nerve. So the spinal accessory nerve usually innervates the trapezius, and in this case, it's a branch. So it's the upper trap, not the entire trapezius. The suprascapular nerve goes to the supraspinatus muscle and the infraspinatus muscle. The supraspinatus muscle starts your abduction, and the infraspinatus muscle is probably the most important um, uh, muscle for external rotation. Then in terms of the rest of the, um, the, the other part of the nerve transfer, then you want to get something to the deltoid because that also abducts. So the, you can sacrifice a radial nerve branch to the triceps because after all, the triceps has many branches of the radial nerve. And then you can co-op that to the axillary nerve and it's usually the axillary nerve branch that goes to the middle deltoid and to the anterior deltoid. So for shoulder function, these two nerve transfers are a nice pair. So just to give you a little bit of anatomy, they're really in close proximity, just like what uh, Dr. Mayan and I talked about earlier. So this provides shoulder abduction and external rotation. Then this is just a picture, again, of intraoperative in terms of the, the incisions that you can make for this. 
And then the radial nerve to axillary nerve. Well, the radial nerve appears in the triangular space, and the axillary nerve is in the quadrangular space. And that's all just separated. Those two spaces are really just separated by the perispace. So they're very close. And if you approach this posteriorly, you'll see that uh, you can do a coaptation very easily there. So there's your incision, there's the two parts, and you can put those together. And so how good is the shoulder function? I know everybody likes to show photos, right? So let me give you some numbers. So these are, this is some old data that still holds. And basically, you get 60 to 80 percent of medical research counsel grade um, greater than or equal to three for the spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve. Um, there's a misprint here I just noticed. It should say uh, CN11, which is the spinal accessory nerve to the suprascapular nerve. I apologize for that. Um, five over seven patients achieved uh, greater than, obviously, 124 degrees of abduction with the radial branch to actually nerve transfer. So if you do that on yourself, that's a reasonably functional shoulder for abduction. And then one thing to note, a double nerve transfer for shoulder function gives better results than a single nerve. So really, if you have the ability to do both, you should do both if you're going after the shoulder. Okay, how about elbow flexion? Well, you have a lot more options here. You can do an ulnar fascicle to the muscutaneous branch to the biceps. So we used to be debating about which fascicle, and Dr. Oberland, who first pioneered this, said, let's get the FCU fascicle. It turns out more recently there's evidence that it doesn't really matter what fascicle you take. Even if you take a fascicle to the um, abductor digiti minimi or to the first dorsal interosseus, that will get you just as good a function of the elbow flexion once you keep the space. Then you can couple the ulnar, to musc ulnar fascicle to muscular cutaneous with a median fascicle for the brachialis. Or you can do a medial pectoral to muscular cutaneous, or you can do an acostal to muscular cutaneous. So you see, I'm beginning to develop a theme here that I'll continue in the latter slides, but basically you have a lot of options. So here is the, a, a diagram of the ulnar fascicle to um, FCU. Again, another misprint, I'm sorry. So it should be flexor carpi ulnaris, and that's in the upper diagram. And this, in the lower diagram, you can, or lower photograph, you can see that little fascicle split off that's now co-opted to the musculocutaneous nerve that goes into the biceps that provides you some elbow flexion and supination. What people don't uh, often get is that supination really comes from the biceps more than it comes from the supinator muscle. You can also strip apart the median fascicle and transfer that to the musculocutaneous to the brachialis. And then you can also uh, use the medial pectoral nerve to the musculocutaneous branch of the biceps. You can also then achieve this kind of result, which is how good is that quantified? Well, it turns out this particular nerve transfer with the ulnar fascicle, when published, was 75 to 95 percent MRC grade four or above, which is really good. And usually you read these articles and you say to yourself, yeah, there's no way, you know, I, I don't get anything near that. Well, I can tell you from personal experience that with this nerve transfer, you do get that. It's a great nerve transfer. And of course, medial pectoral works pretty well too. All right, so just to go over a brief um, case so that uh, uh, we don't tie up time, but this is the typical case that we see, right? It's a motorcycle accident. It is clearly an upper trunk palsy, no function of supraspinatus, infraspinatus, deltoid, biceps, or brachioradialis. The hands, the wrists, they're all okay. Paralyzed hemidiaphragm, well, that clues you off that it's probably a preganglionic lesion. And the EMG is consistent with denervation of the above muscles with normal nerve action potentials, again, going with the preganglionic lesion. And the MRI shows a pseudomeningocele. So all of those things point to a preganglionic lesion. What that means is graft repair is really not an option. So what can you do? Well, you use the nerve transfers that we just talked about for this kind of proximal injury. So once again, what are they? It's spinal accessory to suprascapular, radial nerve branch to the axillary nerve, ulna to muscular cutaneous, and if you want to couple that with a median fascicle to the brachialis, you can. And just a note on that, coupling the two has not really led to a lot of published support for that two for the elbow is better than one. 
Certainly in the shoulder, two nerve transfers is better than one, but not necessarily so for the elbow. So if you, again, the, if you want to take a look at what all the um, reviews are, Dr. Ray at WashU put together this motor nerve transfer review paper. It's a nice resource to have. And in, included in it is exactly this kind of scheme, which is, this is called the otherwise the triple transfer, which is everything we just talked about. So in the last remaining couple minutes, um, this obviously is beyond, uh, this would take like an hour unto itself. So I'm just going to mention this because I think some of this is going to come into play with other applications of these nerve transfers besides brachial plexus. So what are they? Well, you can recover elbow extension. So I put, to, I put up that chart, but that's too much to read. It's contained in a paper. But the bottom line is, if you look at all the comparative data, the um, evidence-based medicine recommends a medial pectoral nerve to a radial branch. Other donors include all the usual suspects. So you can recover wrist and or finger extension, and there's a whole list of nerve transfers you can try. Lots you can try. And what evidence-based medicine recommends is FCR branch to ECRB and FDS to PIP. I'm going to um, give Dr. Mendel a little credit here as far as the tendon transfers go, because at least what I've seen, I have to admit that before you do some of these nerve transfers, it behooves the patient if you are working with a hand surgeon, plastic surgeon, orthopedic surgeon that does tendon transfers, because Sometimes they actually do better at this than the nerve people do. So working together is highly advised. Who has the better shot? And I'll be honest with you, for reconstruction of wrist and finger extension, I personally probably have seen much better results with tendon transfer than I have with any of these nerve transfers. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and um, so for median hand function, absolutely no consensus. Again, it's all contained within the paper. It sort of lists a bunch of different things that you can do. Brachialis branch to AIN is a, po is a possibility. Then for all the hand functions, definitely no consensus, except to say that more and more people are using an AIN branch to pronator quadratus to the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. So basically, this sort of ties in, first of all, that Nerve transfers for brachial plexus injury, especially upper trunk injury, are very, very good at restoring function. You should definitely do it if you get a patient like that. For more distal things, for spinal cord injury, for other things of that nature, you know, considering all the options that you have is something you can do, but please work with your plastic surgeon or your orthopedic surgeon because some of these nerve transfers uh, may use donors that they may need later. So again, a coordinated effort is what's going to benefit your patient. Setting expectations is what's going to benefit your patient. And so I will turn this back to Dr. Mahan so that he can talk about some other applications of nerve transfer. 